Great. Thanks so much for having me, Jens, uh, and uh, the rest of the organizers. It's always a great pleasure. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about tips and sort of tricks. Uh, you know what Peter started, Peter, they always love your talks, uh, so it's terrific. Um, here's my disclosures. Uh, I do teaching for both AOSpine with endoscopy as well as for Troy Max. Um, here's, uh, Jens, I just put that slide in uh, just for you because it's a paper that is submitted. Uh, it's accepted for in a white journal. Uh, we compared uh, more than thousands of our patients uh, that we did uh, endoscopic with 5,936 patients uh, from the propensity scored patient cohort from the Nesquik database. Um, very similar, again, they were propensity scored. Uh, and what we found there is that um, the uh, rate of complex, as a rate of infections was uh, decreased by the uh, rate of 16. So uh, we have, uh, using endoscopic technique, uh, decreases the rate of wound infections by a factor of 16 fold. So uh, I think that's very, very strong data. Uh, and I think that will play heavily into the decision going forward. Uh, here's, for example, uh, a patient, uh, 84 year old female, like uh, Peter said before, you know, these are the patients where you really, you know, uh, thinking twice about operating. We did it four or five endoscopic T lift. You can see on our, uh, you know, app based follow up, back pain came up for two, three days, and then she's kind of pain subsided. The most exciting thing about this, you can see here from a week outward, she started walking much more. And you can see that in a step count. You see up there x rays that I finally dared to present. We got an additional eight degrees of blood doses. So I think that's a um, that's uh, a result from an MIS lift or endoscopic T lift that doesn't need to be, uh, you don't need to hide that anymore. So here's uh, the outlier a little bit uh, of the talk. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about what's important before surgery, talking about the tools, maneuvers, and, and managing complications. Uh, so here's the rest of the slide here that kind of uh, it's fell apart a little bit. So 16 fold reduction of uh, infection serum. Uh, again, the most important thing is that, um, you know, do you really have to have this type of surgery, uh, even an endoscopic surgery is in a, a, you know, has risks, perioperative risks, and the best surgery is the one that you don't do. You want to think about is the scoliosis, instability, previous surgeries, um, you know, endoscopic urology is effective, uh, but, you know, it's not as effective. It's not a level one sort of issue. So for epidural fat, blood, phlegma, you, you, it's harder to address that. And these are alternative approaches, like, you know, Peter said, you know, like, there's nothing wrong about doing an open traditional decompression, fusion, all these things work well. These are little things to look at, at preoperative imaging from an endoscopic perspective. So on the left side here, we have a lot of yellow ligament. On the right side, we have very little yellow ligament. Uh, and so that uh, influences the choice of endoscope. Here you want to do an endoscope where you have a larger kerosene. So for example, a, a, a stenosis endoscope. Uh, then you want to look at the thickness of the lamina right here. You know, it's, there's much more bone there. So you have to expect that your drilling work is going to be much more tedious. Um, facet joint overgrowth. So this is going to be super easy to, to, uh, to you know, find the bony elements. But here is like you're going to, the endoscope is going to be on top of it and you'll, you'll have a hard time finding the bone. And, and this is everybody, anybody who uses metrics uh, knows how, how, how the issues are there. Um, and scoliosis, uh, you know, at a certain uh, degree of scoliosis, you need, uh, you need, uh, you know, arthrodesis uh, surgeries. Um, this is something that comes in really handy uh, in uh, as patients are getting larger and larger. We just uh, put this together and have to publish that. But basically, uh, what we found in our series is that uh, the mean prep time goes up with increase in uh, body weight. However, the procedure uh, time actually stays stable. Hospital stay goes up. And the recovery, the rate of recovery is very similar. And this is just the case I did yesterday at the UW at Harborview. A large lady with uh, borderline called iguana syndrome. That's why I couldn't uh, wait. A BMI of 55. And you can see all the tubes. The, those are the pedicle screws uh, at the hub. I mean, there's just nothing. The de decompression, transforaminal, put in a cage, percutaneous instrumentation, and she's she she already left the hospital. So. Um, this is something that is going to be very hard to beat with traditional technique. You can't do the MIS, it doesn't reach. Open, good luck with a wound infection. Uh, and so I think it's a really good uh, alternative for these very complex cases. So um, tool selection, um, laminoscope, this is how they're built. Uh, you just really want to understand how they're built, where the irrigation channels are, working channels, so you can optimize the use. This is something that this is your approach for a laminectomy. This is not uh, this video that is not changed at all. So this is what you see first. You take a pituitary. You find uh, the lamina here right now. 
and nibble it off. Again, this is not edited at all. So this is this is how long it takes to expose a laminectomy in real time. So taking off the soft tissue. Then we use a bovicotomy, which is cheap because yes, yes, it's it's it, you know it is an issue there. So and do this, clean it up. And here is now the lamina left his rostral, his caudal, and we're cleaning it up. And now we're starting to drill in a second. So here we go. And this is the time it takes to expose a laminectomy. That's it in real time. So is it slow? Yeah, at the beginning, like Peter said, I totally agree with you, but it changes. Uh, you need obviously, uh, you know, durable drills. I, I use to drill quite a bit um, because uh, it's hard at the university to, to be very selective of what you open. Uh, drilling technique for decompression is you always want to drill all the way down there, drill along the yellow ligament attachment down there so that yellow ligament attachment informs the drilling. Uh, these are handy kerosens, so curved kerosens, so you can really reach across there. Um, and you can see the contralateral side and they come in there and you can undercut the contralateral side and get a very good decompression on the contralateral side. Again, uh, pay attention to the thecal sac. And honestly, the thecal sac is controlled with the irrigation pressure and you don't have the nerves and, and stuff flapping in your, in your face. And so that makes teaching much, much safer. And, and so here's uh, contralateral decompression here. Another thing is, again, we've seen that so you can um, use the kerosens uh, when you have a bleed as a, Peter should uh, Jules, you take a bite and suddenly you get the red screen, right? And then you go into the Vaporflex or like the bipolar cautery and you can control that. And again, we're, we're using more and more the the um, the a, a standard Bowie cautery to also detach yellow ligament um, and, and speed up these procedures. Here we go. Uh, there's different uh, interlaminar scopes. Uh, you know, and you can pick it according to the pathology. So it's always worthwhile to, to look at the preoperative imaging. Um, a couple of intraoperative strategies that help to uh, improve your workflow. One of the most important things for interlamina is to get the approach angle right. And we do that by um, finding the end plate view first and adding some caudal tilt and making sure that the spinal processes are lined up on the disc space. And that gives you the optimal trajectory without wasting a lot of time to, to do unnecessary drilling. Um, here is uh, operative perils. Uh, the target area, you can basically make up any type of procedure you want uh, as long as you find the target area. I, re I recently did a, a vertebral artery decompression with the endoscope uh, and you just have to know what area you have you, you land on um, and, and then you can define it. But you have to define the bony area, the typical bony area. Uh, most important thing is you have to see it on imaging. You have to be able to palpate it and visualize it. And common reason why you fail is, you know, the x-rays are not good, overgrown for set joints, the endoscope is not lined up with the sear, and you chase bleeders in the soft tissue and get, you know, you get sort of like, this, you know, distracted there. And so this is really the learning curve. 90% of the learning curve is this, uh, target the area, imaging, palpation, visualization, and there's just not a lot of redundancy there. Uh, efficient bony decompression, the classical mistake there is you can start drilling right in the bone. Uh, but as I've shown you on the video before, the drilling needs to be done along the yellow ligament attachment. If you don't do that, then you just drill unnecessary bone. So the nice thing about this is that the, the, the best interest of the patient is aligned with the best patient of the surgeon, meaning that you want to remove as little bone as you can so that uh, you achieve the uh, adequate decompression. Um, and that obviously, uh, you know, leaves the largest amount of bone and stability for the patient. Uh, contralateral decompression, um, you have to make sure that you have an ap appropriate uh, approach corridor and uh, you have to make sure you appropriately undercut the spinal process. Most common reason for failing contralateral is not planning the incision right um, because you want to switch to the other side right in between the spinal processes. Um, it's also more difficult when there's a large distance between the, the, the pedicles and when the spinal processes are very narrow uh, and we, if you don't undercut the spinal process sufficiently. So this is really important to go contra level. Again, the nice thing is that uh, with the endoscope, you see it very nicely. Um, I see at least one patient a month that had an MISD compression where the contra level for set joint was not on the cut. And with the microscope, this is much harder to see. Uh, dural lacerations, uh, Peter already commented on that. Um, so common reasons is previous operations, steroid injections, old age, severe stenosis, small 
Small lacerations, you don't have to intervene. Medium size can be treated with a dirt and inlay graft to collagen, exactly as Peter showed nicely. Um, and then you put some uh, this seal, so some sealant on top. Larger defects, if nerve roots herniated out, uh, then it's probably better to uh, convert to a large, an open surgery and repair, repair it directly. And this is uh, a little example of a small inlay graft here. Sorry for the tone. So you see that it was a revision surgery. I thought this was scar tissue. And then here we go. So nerve roots are right in between. And so then we put a piece of duragen in there that is half inside, half outside. And it sits there. You, you wedge it in there like Peter showed nicely. Um, and this is a patient, a dear patient of mine. I see her pretty much every week. She's been a, a supporter of my lab and a good friend of mine now. Um, she definitely has no issues from this. So this was a durable closure. And I see this patient once a week. Uh, hemostasis, um, I think also Peter showed very nicely. Um, again, um, common areas, ventral to the caudal lamina, the small uh, arteries there, lateral recess, inferior foramen. Meticulous hemostasis is you, you can't be sloppy with this type of technique. Bipolar, use the bipolar cautery, sort of stay on top of it, adjust the irrigation pressure, and I use epinephrine uh, in my laminectomies. Um, if, if it happens, uh, most important thing is breathe. Um, don't um, you know change this, the the angle of your endoscope. Uh, occlude the egress port, increase the irrigation pressure, and you can inject thrombin or or gel foam powder. Again, it typically can be controlled. It's more an annoyance than than really an issue. This is uh, the last case. Uh, I wanted to finish up here right now. Sixty eight year old male that did an L two three three four. Uh, Decompression on this gentleman, preoperative imaging as shown here, preoperative uh, paper outcome forms are here. Uh, he did fine, however, he woke up okay, but then developed low extremity weakness uh, and to a complete uh, paresis, urinary tension, satellite anesthesia, um, and then the MRI revealed uh, an epidural hematoma. What I wanted to show here right now is, is really important for, and that, that, is, that is important, that both for endoscopic as well as for MIS. So it's a preoperative phase and postoperative. One of these two patients is neurologically totally intact. The other one has the called equino syndrome. Um, and again, what I always teach my residents and fellows, the MI that you get there is not a decision-making, surgery decision-making tool. It really helps you to design the surgery. The, 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 the decision to go back to surgery is a, is a clinical decision. Uh, so which one of those two had a cardiac rhina? Impossible to tell. This one was totally asymptomatic, neurological intact. And you can see the repeat MI three months afterwards looks perfect. Nicely decompressed. You can't give those nerve roots more space. Uh, and this patient had cardiac rhina and needed to go back for decompression. Um, and so, again, the MI is only to fine-tune your surgery, but not the not, does not help you with the decision-making to go back to the OR. Um, and that gets me to the conclusion here. Um, endoscopic surgery is uh, highly efficient and a safe surgical technique. And, and the answer would argue that it is safer than, than traditional MIS surgery uh, for, for certain indications. Um, meticulous surgical uh, technique is necessary and facilitates the progress and the learning curve. Um, complications can be managed both with minimal invasive and traditional strategies. And obviously, there's a, a tremendous amount of, of development going on right now. And again, right now, 2022 uh, endoscopic T-lifts are now on par uh, with MIS T-lifts. And that's going to be the, the exciting um, you know, development the next couple of years uh, that we can show that, uh, you know, demonstrate the efficiency. So thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. So you're in a training program. You have a lot of residents and some fellows coming through. Uh, do they have to be able to run a nice endoscopy on a plastic model? First, I've had a chance to play with some of those plastic models and you came over kind of into our lab. Uh, so what do they have to fulfill so that they're allowed to do one of those surgeries or is it just watch and then see how it works in a patient? Yeah, great question, Jens. Um, so, um, in um, what we have done with these procedures, really split them up into tiny little steps. So it's the targeting, it's the bone, you know, exposing the, the target area, doing the drilling. And so the way uh, I, I, I run my fellowship is, you know, that, that there's safe areas that, that can be done, um, you know, the targeting, the drilling. So basically, they all have to check off each step before they can go to the next step. Uh, each procedure, like a cervical 
for an anatomy, you know, you have to do this, then you have to do this. So each step needs to be checked off and then only then can they advance to the next one. I also do, you know, two or three cadaver labs of them to get them, get them some time. But I'm very proud of my our fellows. Uh, all of them are active and practicing and, and become leaders in the field, which is, has been really awesome to see. Great. We'll move on, but thank you so much for lending your time and expertise.